This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us and for following Working Like Dogs on Instagram and Facebook. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my co-host is my adorable service dog, Lovey. And we're excited to be with you today to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. Today, we're welcoming Glenn Zipper. He developed the Netflix documentary, Dogs, and he co-executive produced it along with Amy Berg. Glenn was actually a prosecutor before he met his dog, Anthony, 16 years ago, and Anthony changed the course of his life. Lovey and I are huge fans of this documentary. We recently binge watched all six episodes, and I can't stop thinking about the stories and the remarkable bond between these very different dogs and their humans. So come right back after these quick messages as we welcome Glenn Zipper to the show. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Pick up two bottles of Lico Chops, get the third bottle free. New improved Lico Chops with omega-6, omega-3, vitamin E, and now six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. And dogs love it. Try Lico Chops. Buy two, get one free. This is Henry Lukasevic for Dynavite. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're so happy to have Glenn Zipper with us today. Hello, Glenn, and welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so excited about the documentary. It was just so wonderful. But we want to start by asking you, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, as you alluded to in your intro, I started my career in some place other than producing films. I was a, a criminal prosecutor on the East Coast, and um, I wasn't particularly happy as a prosecutor for numerous reasons that would probably take up the entire runtime of your podcast. So <laughs> we can skip over those. But one day I had the uh, good fortune to cross paths with a a stray pit bull puppy on the streets of Jersey City. So I encountered Anthony on on the street one day. He was in the custody of some kids that had rescued him out of a bad situation, but he was not healthy. All his his hair had fallen out from Demodex Mange and he was emaciated. The kids didn't have the resources to take care of him. So I asked for the dog and said that I would take it to the vet and uh, expect to help and then find a home for it. And the kids asked to keep the dog for one more night. And I said, okay. And when I went to pick up the dog the next day, the kid's mother had released the dog in the middle of the night. And it's with junkyard of all places. And we searched frantically for the dog and actually found the dog at a local animal shelter. Some kind person had actually picked it up and deposited it there. And when I went uh, to the animal shelter to check on the dog, I learned that the dog was going to be put down because it was ill and the, the shelter was overpopulated. And I had never been in an animal shelter in my life, so... It didn't really make sense to me, but the people that ran the shelter were patient and thoughtful and heard me out and answered all my questions and then took me into the back and showed me that they were just popping at the gills, cage after cage of of the dog that was not going to find a home. And so shortly thereafter, I turned in my badge and began volunteering at the animal shelter every day. And somewhere along the way, I woke up a morning and had a strange feeling and I later recognized that feeling to be happiness. (laughs) <laughs> which is foreign to me at the time. And uh, we did a lot of good work and, and uh, solicited a lot of other volunteers to come help in the fight. And, uh, and eventually most of the dogs started to be adopted. And that, there began my love affair with not just Anthony, who uh, was that puppy who I ended up adopting, but dogs in general. And I wanted to remain happy for the rest of my life, but I couldn't sustain myself volunteering at the animal shelter. So I decided to do what I had always wanted to do with my life, which was, uh, produce film. So I came out to Los Angeles. I didn't know anyone. That's another long story that will probably take too much time. But eventually, 
I found some success and started to make films on my own. And it's come full circle being able to produce dogs with Amy Berg this year. Wow. Wow. Talk about a life-changing experience. That really was. Wow. You became a whole nother person. That's exactly right. Wow. Well, so when you first started getting into films, what kind of films were you doing initially? Well, the opportunity that presented itself was making documentary films. And I was ready to jump at any opportunity. Although when I first came out to Los Angeles, I didn't really expect to be working in documentaries. I thought I'd be working in narratives. But that's where the opportunity was. And I jumped at it. And I began to learn the business from the documentary side of the fence and uh, made a lot of mistakes, stepped on a lot of landmines, but again, you learn. And if you uh, learn from your mistakes, you eventually get better at what you're doing. And started making a lot of music documentaries, first film I ever produced with a Billy Joel doc called The Last Play at Shea. And then eventually a film came in that the company I was working for at the time didn't want to produce. They thought it was a good idea, but it just wasn't really the type of film they produced. They were concentrating on music docs. And so I started a company with my brother and we raised the money to make that film. And that film went on to win the Oscar for Best Documentary Film. It was called Undefeated. Um, wow. And after we won the Oscar, then it was really off to the races. And I think since then we've made something like 25 or 30 films and, and TV shows, and all documentaries, and uh, Dogs just happens to be the most recent. Wow. You're a risk taker, Glenn, and it's paid off for you. That's great. Wow. That's so inspiring for so many people who do want to quit their jobs and follow their bliss. You really did it. Wow. That's exciting. Well, you know, the thing is, taking a risk is one thing, but I think probably that the best thing that anyone could do if they're going to take a risk like that is to also have a plan for what you're going to do if the risk doesn't pay off. I mean, <laughs> sure, I put in a lot of hard work, but there was also a lot of luck. If I didn't find myself at the intersection of hard work and luck, if luck didn't show up, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. So when I made all those decisions that might, in hindsight, be characterized as risky, you know, I did have a safety net to fall back on. I could have gone back to being a lawyer. I might not have been the happiest person in the world if I ultimately ended up being a lawyer again, but I don't want to present myself as someone who took a risk with absolutely no fallback options because then I'd be presenting myself as far more heroic and just taking the ass <laughs> land. Well, I have to tell you, full disclosure, I've been a victim advocate for over 30 years. So I guess that's why I can really relate to what you're talking about, because I still work, mm -hmm. my day job is working in the criminal justice system. So yeah, mm -hmm. I totally, totally can appreciate that. But you're right. And I think some people, you know, they are afraid to take those risks and they see it as failure if they don't get the breaks and the luck doesn't happen and all everything aligns. But I don't see that as failure. I see it as, you know, we have to pursue what what we feel called to do and sometimes we can't continue Absolutely. doing it like we can't but yeah you know I have yeah I have pretty strong feelings about that I think you know you're right it's, if it doesn't work out it's not failure what would be failure is if you had a dream and you didn't try to achieve it exactly. and you wake up one morning and you're 65 years old and you're filled with regret exactly. and if you try and it doesn't work out it doesn't work out but the one thing that you won't have is regret because you will know that you gave it everything that you had and I have to say, that's how I've tried to live my life. Yep, I have thought of that so much that I don't want to wake up one of those days and have that regret. So that makes me love your story even that much more. Yeah, that it's so true. Well, so how did you come up with the idea for dogs? How did that evolve and, and come to fruition? I get that question a lot, and I'm always uncomfortable a little bit because I don't want to say that I, I came up with it. I mean, dogs are, their stories are, are manifestly obvious. You know, we're, we're all connected with them. We all have a familiar journey with dogs. We all recognize how special dogs are and how many journeys people are taking all over the world with dogs. So all I really did, along with Amy, was take that, which we already are aware of and recognize as being so moving and so important to us, and putting it into a package. And putting it into a package just means going into Netflix and saying, hey, let's make a show about this. <laughs> let's get the best filmmakers in the world. Let's go through a list of the best stories that we can find and make sure that of that list, we pick the best of the best with characters that people can really connect with, both human and dog alike. And then let's see what comes out the other side of the, the pipe. And what you're seeing is what that is. And that's season one of Dogs. 
Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that there were all global stories, that you really had stories about dogs all over the world, which was really cool to see. And we all have that in common, that we all adore our dogs and the impact that dogs have on us, no matter where we are on the planet. So how did you pick the stories? It was a group effort. Some of them were, you know, obvious. The story, uh, episode one, Bravo Zeus, Zeus being rescued from Syria, uh, stuck out immediately to all of us. And Amy Berg, who directed the episode, did a wonderful job and was incredibly passionate about telling that story from the moment it hit our desks. Um, And then some of the other ones, we did tick certain boxes or wanted to make sure we were ticking certain boxes about being global, about telling different stories with different types of characters, with different challenges in different geographies. So once we cross-reference the different stories we're looking at with those boxes we wanted to tick, then some of the, the best of the best and the most obvious ones for us to engage with made themselves very apparent to us. And, yeah. uh, and then we also worked in with our, or looped in our filmmakers, and we saw you know, which ones that they were most passionate about and which were the stories that resonated for them and they were most excited about telling. So despite the fact that we might have started with 50 stories that we were very excited about after we went through that entire process, the top six really became somewhat obvious. Wow. Well, and I love the story that you did about four paws for ability and the mm-hmm. story about, was it Corrine and Rory? And it was the, yep. the young woman that had the epilepsy seizures. Wow, that was mm-hmm. so powerful. But I loved how, as having an assistance dog myself, not that I have seizures, but going through that process, that selection process and that bonding and that and that impact, I just thought you did such a beautiful job of showing the realistic, the highs and the lows of it. Well, thank you for that. And that was all really credit to our director of that episode, Heidi Ewing, who did a wonderful job and bonded with the family and earned their trust. And, and they're still very close. And a lot of people who saw that episode were, were very sad for Corinne's sister, who was told that she couldn't have the dog as her own and couldn't pet the dog and all those things. But I have good news. Her sister now has her own dog, which is a dog that failed out of four paws. Awesome. Those <laughs> so are the best dogs, dogs the to get. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I tell all my friends to get on the waiting list for the dogs that don't make it because they don't make it for really strange, tiny reasons, and they will make you an incredible dog. That's yes, awesome. Exactly. So I know we're, my we're husband. Happy they both have dogs now. Yeah, and my husband really appreciated that piece of the film oh. because for him it's the same thing, right? So he really uh, had a strong feeling for her sister and how that it's tough and how she had to deal with that, but she did a really good job dealing with it. Yeah, Indeed. that's great. Well, and Zeus, of course. Oh my gosh, what an incredible dog! Superstar. Oh, love that dog and all of the different people that he impacted. It was just amazing. Everything that they went through to get him out of Syria. How was it's it? Incredible. And that? Yeah, please. That that was, again, all a credit to, to Amy Berg, who was there every step of the way and you know, she put herself in a position where you know, she was in harm's way. She wasn't in Syria. She was in, in Beirut. But nevertheless, it was a, a harrowing shoot. And uh, she made sure that there wasn't a single layer of the story that she missed. And she bonded with every character that you bonded with as an audience, she bonded with as a director, and she remains close to all of them. I know. I've thought of them so much, and I was wondering how they're doing, or if they're still in Germany, or or what's happening. But, oh my goodness, that was a nail-biter. They're all doing well. They're all doing well. Uh, I am and and Zeus are doing well in, in Germany. Amer is in Beirut, but got a job and he's playing in a band. And Nadi, uh, because of his disability, is able to travel more freely and, and he's doing okay as well. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because ugh, I just fell in love with all of them. So, yeah, it was harrowing to watch. Um, I can only imagine what it was to film it and the intensity of that whole situation. But, wow, you guys did an awesome job capturing that and, and keeping us all so engaged. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to take just a super quick break and hear some important messages from our sponsors. And we're going to come back and continue visiting with Glenn Zipper about the amazing documentary Dogs. So come right back. DGP is an all natural formula proven to help aging pets with joint and mobility problems. It goes to work quickly, providing vital nutrients to the joints while reversing the effects of age. 
Some people see results in as little as seven days. Don't let your dog struggle another day. Call 800-521-0543 or visit dgpforpets.com and enter the code WORK, W-O-R-K, for 25% off your first order and free shipping. We wear fur and we're damn proud of it. What? And our four legs and our tail and we go to the bathroom outside. Well, we may not be too proud of that. (laughs) Sniff around, then mark your spot right here. Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And we're visiting today with Glenn Zipper about his amazing Netflix documentary, Dogs. And before the break, we were talking about Zeus, who I have to say that, I don't know, it's hard to say which one is my favorite, but I think Zeus may be. But I also really enjoyed the episode um, about Ice. Can you tell us a little bit about Ice and his story? Well, Ice is uh, a dog that has resonated with so many people. Go on to social media. There are people who are tweeting about Ice, posting pictures of Ice to Instagram, wanting to know more about Ice, wanting to travel to Italy to spend time with Ice. So it's a close call between Ice and Zeus as to who the breakout (laughs) star was. But Ice definitely offers the most uh, romantic story. He's sort of the mascot of of a lovely restaurant in Lake Como, Italy and a true member of the family. He even sits at the table with them when they eat dinner, like literally in a chair, if you haven't seen the episode. <laughs> yes. And so he offers in a, a sort of a, a backdoor way of telling the story of a family and also of a trade because Ice's dad is not only the proprietor of the restaurant, he's the fisherman who goes out and catches food for the catches fish to serve at the restaurant every day. And seeing both sides of that story Ice is part of the family, and Ice as also a partner to his dad, the fisherman, is, is something really special to see. And like I said, he's a dog that has really captured the hearts and minds of perhaps the most viewers of dogs this year. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, he is so intense. The look on his face and the presence that he has and how present he is with each member of that family, but especially his dad and the dad of the family and how they go out fishing together and how he's just, he's so involved in every aspect of their lives. Do you know how Ice is doing now? He's doing great. He's really doing well. And um, fans of the show did something really amazing. They were so obsessed with ice that they went onto Google Maps and they just wanted to take a look at the restaurant on Street View. <laughs> and they, they discovered that when you go to find the restaurant, which is called Mella in Lake Como, Italy, on Street View, what do you see standing out in front of the restaurant? Ice. Oh, my gosh. He's on, he's on Google Maps. Oh, okay. Well, you know what I'll be doing when we're done talking today? Because I will have to see Ice. Oh, my gosh. He's so adorable. And you said the name of the restaurant is Mella. Is, and how do you spell it? M-E-L-L-A. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, I know I'm going to be going to check that out. I mean, Ice is just, oh, he is just the wisdom, the depth of his personality is just, yeah, yeah, he is. You just want him to say something. He's got this look on his face and you just wish he could talk and tell you what he's thinking because it it just is so wise and loving and, and genuine. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And the other story that I thought was really amazing, too, was the whole story in Costa Rica. It's truly uh, incredible. I've not seen anything like that before. You're referring to Territorio de Zaguates, which is a sanctuary in Costa Rica that has over 1,400 dogs now that just roam free. And it's uh, also lent itself to a lot of debate because when you have 1,400 dogs all in one place, there's going to be mange, there's going to be other skin afflictions and complaints that the dogs are dealing with. And it's very difficult to tend and give care to that many dogs at once. But the alternative is those dogs probably won't survive. And there are some people who think if these dogs can't be cared for in a way that we would care for them in the United States at a rescue shelter, then perhaps we shouldn't care for them at all and just let fate do as it may to them. And then there are other people who say, hey, if they can be in this sanctuary and at least get a second chance at life, then they should do that. 
And uh, we tried to not come at it with any particular point of view and let audiences decide for themselves. And that episode was directed by Dan Lindsay and T.J. Martin, who directed Undefeated, the film that I referred to earlier in our interview that, that did win the Academy Award a few years back, as they always do. I thought those guys did an amazing job and gave you an immersive experience in that story that otherwise would have been inaccessible to audiences. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, and I really, I was torn, I have to say, watching it, because just as you described, but as you said, I mean, at least these dogs, they are loved. They are in a safer place at that facility, but but wow, the consequences and the demands. And then the, the whole story that they told about one of the employees, one of the staff members, and the struggles that he was going through and the dog that was having such an impact on him. Oh my gosh, that was so powerful and heartbreaking. Yeah, you're referring to Johnny and Johnny and Max, and Johnny was another character who was suffering from from some sort of undiagnosed seizure condition that may or may not have been epilepsy. I don't want to give away the scene, but there is a scene where Johnny is afflicted by a seizure, and and what the dog does in that scene is just mm. unbelievable. Uh, when I saw it for the first time, I was just weeping. Yeah, I was too. And all the stories, Glenn, it's like, it is, it's you're weeping, you're elated, you take us through all the emotions, because it's not always rosy, you know, and that's life. And you guys, the way that you told those stories was was so real and genuine. And it hurt. It was hard. It was hard to watch some of it. But I could stop. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, a lot of people have commented about how much the show has made them cry. That may have contributed to a perception that the show isn't a happy show and that it's depressing. And I think you'll probably agree that that's not the case. As you were just saying, there are some tough moments, but no dogs die. And when you leave each episode, you do leave each episode from a very hopeful place. There's no episode that has an unhappy or a sad ending. And, yeah, And for the most part, if you're crying, you're having happy tears by the end of the episode. Right. Well, and also you leave the episodes educated. You know, I mean, yeah. I really felt like you did a really good job educating people about, you know, the issues that Corrine and Rory, you know, about epileptic seizures and how hard that is and how that impacts a family and how you can get a dog that can help you with that. I mean, that was a lot of education. And the same thing about Syria, about how what a crisis it really is and how people are being treated. I mean, there's so much education that you provided was really, that was so powerful. Well, thank you for that. And the stories, because we want them to be dramatic and compelling, we're picking the stories that have the extreme example of someone that needs to rescue a dog from Syria, or that a story that confronts a refugee crisis, a story that confronts someone with epilepsy. But in our everyday lives, sometimes we're not confronted with problems that are that extreme, but maybe life is feeling a little bit gray. And a dog could help someone like that too. I know that a dog changed my life uh, in incredible ways that otherwise would not have been possible. And that dog has become a receptacle for so many of the needs of my life and things that I need to be happy. So even for a person that is leading an ordinary life, a dog can really be a game changer and take your life to a a much happier place. Yes, they can. They can change your life. I could not agree with you more. But how did you guys remain objective to really make sure that you were telling these stories accurately? How did you do that? I mean, that's something that you learn over the course of making documentaries to something that is demanded of you in this job. And there's a saying that I use, which is when we tell a story, we have to tell it with a cold eye and a warm heart, which means that we don't have to check our empathy at the door, but we do have to remain objective and tell the story from a perspective where we're not putting our thumb on the scale, where we're presenting the story as it really unfolds it to an audience and let them draw their own conclusions. Yeah. Well, I would say you definitely have a gift for that, Glenn. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, and so you mentioned some of the some follow up with some of the characters and their dogs. Are you maintaining connection with all of them? Yeah, um, we've been in touch with everybody. I'm happy to say that there's no bad news about any <laughs> one character or dog. All the reports we're getting are positive. And so knock on wood, we hope it keeps going in that direction. Good. I know. Well, I think I was most worried about Ice because he is an older dog. And so I was worried that that Ice is doing well. I'm so glad to hear that because, boy, that's going to be a tremendous loss to have to face after him. And tough shoes for another dog to try to fill. Wow. Yeah. 
I don't know that any dog will ever fill those shoes, but I don't hopefully think so. Ice has got quite a bit of time left. You know, he's, I think, 12. My dog is 16. The, the, the science keeps getting better. The food that we feed our dogs keeps getting better. I think we're doing a better job even just loving our dogs, and that, that contributes yeah. to their longevity. So let's just keep hoping for the best. Yes, absolutely. Well, do you have any plans to do any other episodes? Well, I think ultimately that is up to Netflix if they'd like to do subsequent seasons of the show. Amy and I would love to, and we're standing by. Oh, okay. Well, you'll have to keep us posted on that because, like I said, I binge-watched all six, and now I'm like, I need more. So (laughs) I'm hoping... I I can promise you this. um, Whether it's it's dogs or uh, Netflix or in another format and a film and different television series and, and other forms of entertainment... I will be telling dog stories for the rest of my life. So rest assured, you won't have to wait long. Oh, good, good. Can you give us any hint of what you're working on now? Sadly, no. We we have to handle all of these things with with the utmost secrecy. It's very cloak and dagger. But as soon as we have an update, uh, we'll let you know. People can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter username is at Zipper, Z-I-P-P-E-R, and I'm posting every day. And as soon as I have updates about dogs on Netflix or anything else, I promise to post it. Okay, awesome. And tell us that one more time on Twitter. What is it? At Zipper? At Zipper, like on your pants. Mm Z-I-P-P-E-R. Okay, awesome. Okay, good. Well, we'll definitely be following. And how can our listeners get more information about dogs? Well, if you have Netflix, all you got to do is type D-O-G-S into your search bar and it'll come up. Um, (laughs) And uh, if you follow me on Twitter again, I'm posting about the show and memories from the show and photos from the show just about every day. Awesome. And about the individual stories, because I know I had to Google to find out about some of them, about Zeus and Ice. And is there any other websites that have been set up for any of the other stars, I should say, instead of characters? There's not individual websites for characters, but Netflix has their own Instagram page for dogs, and it's at Netflix Dogs. And if you go to at Netflix Dogs on Instagram, they're posting updates and pictures about the dogs that you visited with in the series all the time. Oh, great. Okay, good. Good. So we can get more more of them because we can't get enough. The, The stories are just so compelling and just, yeah, they're powerful. Well, Glenn, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yes. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And I hope you'll come back and and tell us more about future projects when you're able to talk with us about them. I would love to do that. It's a deal. Awesome. Well, and thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We love to hear from you. So please keep those emails coming. And you know you can reach us at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. And you can also follow Working Like Dogs on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We love seeing photos of you and your working dogs and get to see the incredible work that they're doing every day. So thanks so much for being with us and take good care. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.